And now, for a live audience recording of CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast, please welcome to the stage David Spark, creator of CISO Series, and hey. JJ Agha, CISO of Compass. Thank you very much, that voice, wherever it's coming That's it. from. Come on, baby. Hey, everybody. Come on in. Come on in. This is, I guarantee this is going to be fun. Those of you having <laughs> drinks, come on in. Come on in. Join us. Remember, must fun. be present to So win. we're going to start the recording in just a moment. Please come join us. Get a seat up front. We love it when you're up front. Please, if you do need to talk, if you do need to have a conversation, do me a favor. Go away from us. Stay and he meant far that in away. a very warm because and loving way. We're know? trying to record a show and we don't want your conversation a part of it. But we want you here. <laughs> thank you. Ah, oh, thank you so much. All right. Ah, you're so kind. Thank you so much. All right. So here's how it's going to work we're going to do a live show. Um, we're going to start the recording. If any of you have ever heard the show, the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast, that show right there. Um, you know that we have all these musical bumpers and it, and it goes all through. We're going to play that. And you, we have microphones on the audience as well. So you are going to be part of the show. So please make the appropriate noise when appropriate at any time through the show. Please feel free to do that. If there's a little flub, no big deal. We edit things out. But we're going to try to make a nice, clean, roll a show for you, make a real fun show for you in general. Just so you know, the episode that we are recording right now will air on November 30th on CISOseries.com. So... You can look for it there. Uh, also, just keep in mind, we're going to have a series of rotating guests, too, but I'll explain that also when we show. Anyways, gentlemen, are you ready? Ready to go, baby. All, All right. right. We're ready back there. We're recording. Oh, yes? Right. Yes. We are recording. All right. Good. Let's begin. 10-second security tip. Go. CISOs must learn how to communicate their activities, their intent, and their strategies in ways that non-technical people understand. And the way a CISO talks to an HR person is not the same way you're going to talk to the CEO. It's not going to the same way you're going to talk to the general counsel. Last quick story. Very first time in the job. I'm, I'm getting ready to go down and see the President of the United States, and I'm going to brief him on cyber security strategy. I sit down with my team. They go through this great presentation. At the end of which, I look at them and go, guys, that's great. You and I understand this. If I talk this way to the president, he will just look at me like I am an idiot. We have got to learn how to communicate in ways that he and others can understand. So I've lived this myself. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast, recorded in front of a live audience in New York City. Work it, baby, work it. Welcome, everybody, to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. We are live in New York City. Prove it to you that you're actually here. Yes, we're actually here. Those of you standing in the back, I see plenty of chairs up here in the front. Please feel free. There's not going to be a point where you're going to want to run out of here. We're going to have fun for the next 45 minutes. Uh, joining me on stage is... Uh, a guest CISO that I've had on this stage before, but he's taken on a new title. It is JJ Aga, the CISO of Compass. JJ, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I was telling David this is my second time in the city uh, since uh, the pandemic, and both have been for the uh, CISO podcast. So it, uh, I'm glad to be here and guest uh, co host with uh, David. Well, so this is a reason to come into the city as evidenced by this nice, wonderful crowd out here as well. Um, our sponsor for today's show, who happens to be the sponsor of this conference called KeyConf, which is happening here in lovely New York City, is a keyless. They are a secrets management company, and we are going to talk a lot about secrets management tonight, and we'll be talking about things related to that, like zero trust and, and uh, secure access and whatnot. But the gentleman uh, that you heard at the beginning, he's going to be our first guest. We're going to have a series of rotating guests for the show, and I'm really thrilled to have him here. Uh, as you can see, that he's, he's worked in a high-profile position before, as you have heard in this uh, beginning tip. It is the former NSA director and commander of U.S. Cyber Command, Admiral Mike Rogers. Mike, thanks you hey, for joining Dave, us. thanks. Great to be here today. Close your eyes and visualize the perfect oh. engagement. So on May 12th, President Biden signed Executive Order 14028, quote, improving the nation's cybersecurity. There were tons of key points, but I'll zero in on 
the need to improve sharing between the government and private sector, improving standards and supply chain security, and the need to adjust network architectures so as to adopt zero trust cybersecurity principles. Mike, I am going to start with you on this one. Okay. Three questions. Of the items on the executive order, which is a lot more than what I just listed correct, there, yeah. what's going to be the easiest to accomplish, the hardest, and which one do you believe is the most critical? So easiest, I would say, is probably zero trust. Now, it's not easy, but it is within the span of control of most organizations. A lot of people are this. shocked. I'm shocked to hear but you say that. You can do this yourself. Well, compare the other two. The okay. one that I think is the hardest is supply chain because in part yeah, much right. of it is outside of your direct span of control and quite frankly you are going to have to work with others to create the changes you need and that's not always easy the one that i think is the most in some ways most important in terms of long term i would argue the information sharing piece because quite frankly if we cannot come up with a better collaborative I don't like the phrase collaboration, I like integration. I like the idea we're gonna work side by side 24 seven, particularly in key areas within the private sector and the government, the whole idea of the government supporting the private sector, not the other way around. Um, I, I think the information sharing piece is the hardest, because if we can't get that right, we it's like you are fighting with one hand tied behind so your back. So this is a discussion we've had time and time again, and then always the issues of the but, well, oh, and you know, we can't let this information get out. Let's just start with the positive here, and I'll start with you, JJ. Where have you shared information and it's actually worked? So I share information typically through um, the FBI if there's ever a ransomware, and then secondly, it's, it's through your peer network, right? You have a trusted peer network where you would want to share hashes and I, you know, IOCs. Uh, that transparency where you already have a built, uh, agreed upon trust, you're using uh, you know, uh, typical flags on how to share information. Uh, but I think one of the big things looking at the executive order is just having a repeatable run book, right? So following what Mike talked about with transparency, well, how do I actually give this information out? How do I share it, right? Do I, do I call every AG and every state AG attorney? Do I go down and, and reach out to every single FBI bureau that, you know, uh, that I need to reach out to? We need a, a repeatable process for the private sector, and using a runbook will just help unlock every single step, very similar to the zero trust conversation, or very similar to the uh, transparency conversation about sharing information. Yeah, there is no doubt, we gotta make this, I give you two examples that come to mind, solar winds. So the main, the main target was governments, not the only one, but the primary target, and yet who discovered it? it wasn't the US government, it was the private sector. And, and I've kidded Kevin Mandiant about this. It's great that FireEye came forward. I said, but you know, Kevin, you spent two weeks internally investigating this. Then by the time the government gets this, it, we've got to be working together. Well, side this by is just side. more eyeballs on the problem. Um, like there's as great as the government could be, or as great as the private sector can be, if you just got more eyes on the problem, everyone's in better shape. And you get more data. Yeah, I think the, the issue is that way. we stigmatize incidents, we stigmatize breaches. You see it on every single ambulance chasing with every single vendor. Yeah. You see it on the news, you know, where everyone's worried about the stock price dropping. But typically you see it drop and then jumps to 20% of above we, market value. We just had a guy from the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report in another conference I was at showed a chart that six months after public companies that had a breach, there was absolutely no difference in terms of right. where their stock price went. It was an equal, you know, essentially bell curve distribution. Because I would argue some organizations use this as a way to come out stronger to build your reputation. Look at how FireEye responded. I thought they came out stronger. I think people were impressed by open, transparent. Here's what we know, here's what we don't know. Hey, this happened to us, we acknowledge it. The important thing is to make sure it doesn't happen to you. Now let's focus on how we're gonna make sure it doesn't happen to you. I give them big points. We need more like that. All right, final thoughts on this, JJ. So I think a, a very another example was the CodeCov incident, right? A, a supply chain attack on the application stack and you know, talking about the SDLC, and they did a great job about being transparent and just giving information as they found out, and it was a fluid conversation, it was a dynamic conversation. It, they weren't scared about opening their doors and saying this is what's happening, uh, and it caused that more eyeballs on the problem and more folks were pr providing solutions to the challenges that they were uh, 
being faced with. So I think just being open, being transparent will pay dividends than trying to keep it close to your chest uh, and trying to hide it away because that's where you'll end up with a cake on your face a year down the road. And in the end, you can't control it anyways. I used to say in government, guys, we need to work as if everything we do is gonna become public knowledge, okay? It just makes life so much easier. The decisions aren't easy, but in the long run, it's the smartest way to do business. What's the best way to handle this? So as I mentioned, we're going to have a host of characters who are on stage, and I'm very excited to have our next guest who is literally sitting right down now, and he's got some stuffed animals for us. Thank you. These, are, these look like stuffed gorillas. Well, people, yeah. I just, uh, yeah, I thought about well, you. Well, let me introduce you for a second. Oh, for this it. is uh, Oded Harriman, who is the CEO and co-founder of Aquilas. And is this the Aquilas gorilla? What is this thing? This is the Key Kong. Oh, we are at Key Kong, oh, and this is Key Kong. Oh my God! Come on, David. Who's getting blamed for that horrible joke? Is oh, it you? Come on. <laughs> uh, well, we have. Uh, all right, we'll put a picture of the Key Con <laughs> on there. Uh, all right, here's my question: Here, what are the problems with secure remote access that we're still struggling with? Over on the Cloud Security Alliance blog, Al Alex Vakulov asked this very question. He brought up two interesting issues that more of a company's network is being transferred to the cloud, and that's causing new issues that companies weren't prepared for. And secondly, maybe I don't want uniform access for all employees. So certain employees maybe should have higher tier access requirements. So JJ, looking back at the beginning of COVID and now, what do you believe has been the biggest changes of how you're handling secure remote access? So I think when COVID broke out, it was a mass, you know, mass dash to getting uh, secure remote access up and running, right? We have to secure the workforce. We have to ensure that uh, the business can t continue to operate, right? That was the main uh, operative. Now, if you look at where we currently are, it's, it's following kind of these, you know, zero trust models, right? The idea of multiple concepts coming together, creating that conglomerate of, of ideas and really following kind of least privileges, really tackling IEM, but tackling asset management to improve secure remote access and just kind of getting away from the, you know what, we have a gateway, we have a proxy, secure remote access is done. That, that's 1% of the problem. The problem is diving in deeper. And once you start kind of evolving that as the company matures, as you really start bringing out different risk and different patterns, you could solve for the longer patterns. And now I think as, as we've progressed um, over the time, over the, the two years, it's really solving and standardizing on patterns and moving away from kind of the anti-patterns. Uh, and, and our developers really have kind of embraced that, right? And they're really diving into, hey, I have this SaaS app, I have this new endpoint, how can we actually look to get it behind their secure remote access and not just say it's behind the proxy, it's well, what authorization is needed? And I think that's the, the next question, right? You could solve authentication, but what are they authorized to do? And how can you make that dynamic and move away from static conversations? So connecting the identity with the application and the data, all three together? And the network. And, and the, the network. network. I think that this is, I'm sorry to, uh, but um, I think that this is, this is the, one of the most interesting things around security mode access. Basically, it's an involvement. Yeah, I know, the key con. Uh, <laughs> yeah, key con. It's like, okay. <laughs> but um, anyway, so one of the most interesting part with security mode access is that today, well, usually or, or traditionally, we would have thought as the remote access is a problem of maybe um, a network security, right? Um, VPNs for that sense, right? Then it's done and it's fine. But what happens the last few years is that we see a convergence between those two, uh, those two worlds, between the network security and the IAM, of the access management for that sense, right? So now people are looking on more of a holistic approach, which means that you need to somehow combine your VPN together with your maybe privileged access management, right? Together with some session recording tools and so on. And the problem is, as this uh, particular person that you were um, mentioning, uh, the problem is sticking all of those all together, right? It's a lot of tools, and what do you do with it? Obviously, uh, um, I see it as an opportunity, um, both for those teams also to be working together, the network people that are usually uh, interested with zero trust initiatives, right? Uh, together with the IAM people. So one of the things that this author, uh, Alex, was mentioning about the fact that if you have higher tier people, you put more checks in place. So the idea is if a person is sort of um, an employee that only needs sort of low access, doesn't really need any high access, you know, administrative access, 
you're not putting that many checks in place. Do you, in your environment, uh, JJ, do you have more checks in place for people like who are transferring money or who have admin access where, or are you giving like kind of everybody the same level of checks? So I think you have to look at the, what you're trying to solve with a secure gateway, right? If it's a VPN, are you trying to solve for the network transport layer? You're trying to encrypt all the packets that go over it? Well, could you put the controls as close to the application as possible, to the software, to the user? And I think that's where you're seeing this kind of idea where the convergence of networks and applications, that, that is happening when you go into the cloud, right? You need a service, you need identity, you need asset, and they all need to talk to a data store. But there, you can't conflate all three of these identities to be one and the same, a, a service to service authentication, an identity to service authentication to a data store, they're, they're all different. Uh, but for, for us, I think the approach is, the, the conversation is what is VPN actually solving? And I think it's not solving anything anymore, right? You have DNSSEC, you, 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 the, the packet layer of what you're trying to solve for for VPN um, kind of goes away. And so now- is it, is it what you're saying, it's just too far away now? And if you look at the OSI model, potentially, yeah, because if you're looking at it, it's sitting right in the middle. I want to get as close to the data store. I want to get as close to the application as possible. And this sits kind of in the middle, so it does a little bit of something, right? I, I could say, hey, you only have access to the subnet, but what do I, what, what exists in my subnet? I need a policy broker. I need a policy engine. And that's where I need, that's where I really get down to the zero trust kind of solution. Uh, but again, it's, 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 combining these multiple technologies and having kind of that holistic approach to solve for it. And then you could actually build something that's scalable. But or else you're gonna have a VPN here, you're gonna have a VPN out to you know, Azure network, uh, a bastion host to get to your, your, uh, you know, your backend infrastructure. It's just a mess of, and a, a hodgepodge of, of multiple solutions. And so Zero Trust is there, you know, secure remote access will follow the lines of what Zero Trust is, is should be solving for. It's just going to take a matter of time and, and continuous, uh, you know, iteration to get there. It's not a, a one solve, you know, one shoe fits all. It's what patterns does your organization need, and then what, what infrastructure could support your patterns, and then go implement that. Well, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. <laughs> no, that's fine. I couldn't agree more. That's, I had no addition on that. It's time to play What's Worse. All right, everybody. For those who are not familiar with our show, we play this game called What's Worse, where we give you two scenarios. They're both horrible. You're not going to like either one of them. And it's a risk management exercise. You have to determine which of these two scenarios is truly worse. And uh, I reached out to Nir Rothenberg, who's the CISO of Rapid, and I asked him, hey, could you give me uh, a couple of words, what's worse scenarios in the area of secrets management? So it's tailored just for you. Oh, thank you. Good, thank right? Thank you so much. A so lot, you of, pressure, a lot like of pressure. So there are going to be two horrible situations. And we're going to play two rounds of this, by the way. And by the way, the audience, you're going to be voting to which one you like and don't like. I always ask my co-host to answer first. So this gives you more time, Oded, to think of your answer, all right? So here we go. First scenario, again, both from Nir Rothenberg. So thank you very much. Scenario number one, you have short, easily brute force keys that are rotated every nine days to more no, new short keys, okay? Crappy length keys, but they're rotated every 90 days. And now the opposite, which I think you can see where this is going, you have long, complex keys that are never rotated. What's worse? Uh, option two, long term that never rotates. Uh, and why is that? I think you'll get to, you know, one of the uh, speakers talked about, you know, an incident or a challenge and you have to rotate. It's just best practices about having kind of short-lived ephemeral keys that are immutable, right? But you want to kind of leverage short uh, TTLs and, and have easily rotatable. Uh, so you think that you're going to get more damage from that than a short key, again, easily brute force. Again, we're not assuming that this long key has appeared on some public database anywhere or that it's been hard-coded. It's just one short. You yep. still believe that? Still believe it because the day I say, hey, this key was leaked, I saw it in a Git repo, it's on a, a, a paste bin, it's on a GIST that's publicly available, I ask the service owner, hey, can you rotate this? I'm going to be staring at a blank wall and oh, the, three days you, of down you, service. You are permanently owned at, at that <laughs> yeah. point. Okay. All right. Agree or disagree? Well, I definitely agree, but I'll tell you even more. 
when you're going after that long-lived keys for that sense, you miss an opportunity to have to change uh, in the terms of crypto agility. And that's the major problem. When you're having keys that are constantly rotated, although it might be they, compromised. Uh, uh, well, although probably because it, it's brute force here. But you do have the opportunity because your organization basically is used to rotating them. So you actually okay. know where they are, right? With the long, longer keys, there is a major risk of actually losing track of them because no one really remembers where they are, right? That's the major problem. So I would definitely go with the short-lived rotated keys because that would allow us, or whatever, that would allow you to basically one day more easily to change their strength. Okay, so you you have this sort of temporary insensitivity, or temporary well, sensitivity, I'm sorry, that gets rebooted. It, Again, it, they both stink, we're agreeing on that. Yeah, All right, yeah. Yeah. now I want audience <laughs> response. Scenario number one, short keys uh, always rotated. Is that the worst scenario or no? By applause? Nobody, so I think you're agreement here. Applause, second scenario, long keys. <laughs> Never rotated. That All was right. easy, David. I'm sorry. All right. We're in, we're I'll, take your your surprise. I'll take that softball. Right. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll get a little bit more split on the second scenarios. Uh, here, here we go. Two scenarios. You manage secrets in a secrets manager, a vault. Oh, that sounds great. But here's where it gets bad, Oda. You're not going to like this part. That everyone in the company has access to. Everybody. All right. That's scenario one. Scenario two. Again, you're not going to like this. Your keys are hard-coded. Ooh, that hurts. But your access controls are super tight. Only the few people who need to see a repo have access to it, and this is audited frequently. JJ, what's worse? They are, uh, this is a, a better question than one. This is hard. I'm going to uh, hopefully pick the contrarian one for ODED, so it's a nice little conversation. But I'm going to pick that everyone has access. Is worse. Is worse. Um, just because everyone could see, you know, your your keys, everyone can now access the service, um, and so you have the insider risk. You have a lot of, you know, copy paste, uh, previous escalation. Great that you could see everything, and it might be auditable. Uh, I'd rather have my keys hard coded with tighter access controls, so that I could say, hey, these three people uh, have access to it. I know it's a it's a smaller blast radius. It's still not ideal. They're both terrible, uh, but at least I could kind of shrink my blast radius is where, where I'm thinking about it. So right. I, I disagree here. You uh, disagree? Yeah, I, I, I think you would love that. Um, <laughs> so hard-coded within your source code, this can turn out into a massive or a major problem of a leakage. Well, it, it sounds like and it's it the same scenario as scenario two from the last question, yes? Well, not exactly, because with this problem, when you have them hard-coded, you're actually having the risk of having your source code to be exposed and that means to expose your internal keys or secrets for that sense to the external world. Where in the first option, what you said, the entire company inside or the entire development, no, they have access to At it. At least they're employees you hired and you trust them. But that's an insider threat problem, right? So it depends where you feel that you're stronger. But The anyhow, people you know versus the people you don't know. Who are you afraid more, right? With, from your employees or the problem that they might have to do a mistake that would cause a leakage outside within your hard-coded. So right? if you fear your employees inside, then the problem is in HR. Well, that's, 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 a, different, that's a different question. You can serve that for later on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Now, audience, I want audience applause on this. Worst scenario, we have a split decision up here, is uh, secrets in the secrets manager, but everyone has access to it. Who thinks that's the worst? By applause. Good amount, good amount. That's a All hell. right, number two, your keys are hard-coded, like what Odid says, and, but you got super tight controls on it. Who thinks that's the worst? That's the worst. That's the worst. I'm All sorry. right, a little bit more that's, for you, Odid. That's not even half. More. That's 80. <laughs> yeah, who, who's our 20. sponsor for this one? <laughs> <laughs> that's something I'd like to avoid. So on Medium... Uh, a developer, Boemo Mopelwa, wrote about costly mistakes developers make when managing secrets and how to avoid them. His list is pretty much a hit list of top errors, such as hard-coding secrets, exposing them on GitHub, poor password management, using weak encryption algorithm, and poor protection of secrets in transit. And lastly, not using a secrets manager. So, Odid. Sounds like a smart guy. Yes. How many, because my feeling is 
Secrets management does not come up at the beginning. My question to you is how many black eyes do companies get before they finally choose to use a secret manager? So today, as far as we see it, um, the, it is no longer a question. So back then, let's say even uh, three years ago, two years ago, when you were speaking with people about secrets management, might be that most of them would not necessarily know what you're talking about and whether was the problem, right? Uh, not everyone were exposed to that problem. But today, they don't really need to have some kind of a, a, a breach to actually see the problem because it's becoming more and more best practices. Um, so, and, and have you, by the way, have you seen your sales cycle change as a result being that like when you were, because you've been around for how many years now? Um, you can say uh, two since, two years. Uh, since so, first funded, yeah. Yeah, so when you were first talking about this with potential customers, my guess at the beginning, there was a consistent, considerable amount of education around just the concept of secrets management. So the change was phenomenal um, as the COVID um, came actually uh, beforehand. It was like, um, yeah, you had to speak with people about what it is. But then what happened, especially in the last 18 months, is that something happened there. The cloud, obviously, the cloud demand was happening, right, uh, was uh, increasing. And as a result of remote work, right, everything was tied up together. And then when the cloud initiatives turned on, then suddenly secrets became a problem for many companies. So we definitely seen uh, a, a great rise of, of, of that traction in the, in the requirements of, of secrets management specifically. JJ, I'm going to ask, you, you've worked at a, a few companies in security. When did secrets management, just the discussion of it, all of a sudden say, hey, we've got to start taking this seriously? I want to say probably 10 years ago, but we were in infrastructure as a service, right? We were CDN, and that was kind of my first, you know, four way into secrets management, right? So you were you were enlightened to it early on. Yeah, I mean, I again uh, had a luckily to be kind of enlightened and, and exposed to that problem. But I would say from the conversations and what I see in, in the vendor space has probably been, you know, what Oded said, probably three to the, the last three to two years, you see this conversation kind of pivoting past privilege access management, right? That problem of, hey, store all your secrets here, or you could SSH, you could pull it down. Um, that works for the network layer, but now as that convergence conversation about what you're doing for SCM, what you're doing for, for Google Vault, like how do you solve for this multi-cloud, multi-infrastructure uh, environment? I think that's where, you know, where we talked about what, what are best practices, keeping it ephemeral, keeping it immutable, you know, having it easily uh, uh, ro rotatable, that's where you're going to need that platform. And then that's just a service, but when you start talking about I have a key that is overprivileged, right, I, well, I want to start thinking about overlaying like detection and response to it, right? I want to start having honey keys and honey tokens so identify, well, you know, hey, I think everything works great, but if someone checks out this key, oh, I, I know I'm hosed right now immediately. Um, and then also just the idea of like a uh, repo man of, of what Netflix kind of open source, but kind of looking at the privileges that are constantly being used, looking at the service that a key constantly uses. If we see a new service check out that key, raise a flag, why is this happening, right? Is this, do we have this kind of, you know, checked in, is this appropriate? And I think that's where we're seeing the, you know, the services heading towards from a secrets manager. And even you see other companies that have started off as a password manager, but realizing for humans, right, and now pivoting towards saying, I have to solve this for services. I have to solve this for non-human uh, keys. I think it took us time as an industry, as a security industry, to basically understand that, like the shift that happened very fast within 10 years, right? Since containers have become to be like in such a great use, right? Well, think of it. 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you've had more employees in larger companies, right? More employees in actual servers, right? And today, you have in an order of magnitude a major change of number of number of computers, servers, and workloads much, much higher than your privileged users, right? This change, that shift took us time as an industry to actually understand, right? What, what does it mean? What do we do? Oh, workload, this is now the big thing. I, I want to set you up here because I, I want you to give an opportunity to tell our audience exactly what a key list does because I actually, you know, all day prior to me re recording this podcast, I've been interviewing people, uh, some of them your customers, and they talked about that they looked a lot of, at a lot of, uh, you know, secrets management programs. I, I'm interested just... Give me an idea, or our audience really, an idea, what a key list is doing in this space, 
and what sets you apart from your competition in the space and why why you think your customers choose you over others? Oh, sure. So we are the secrets management company, right? So we provide secrets management and in short, obviously is the ability to completely eliminate the secrets within the places that they don't need to be, right? And then to be able to centrally manage them. Uh, and what differentiates us uh, from our uh, competitors, obviously, is uh, number one, uh, SaaS, right? Uh, it's a much more easier to, uh, to use. Fast to production, obviously, no maintenance required, no heavy maintenance for that sense. Um, obviously, we're providing a product which is wider uh, with some greater functionality that we provide. Um, we have a stronger security model in terms of the cryptography that we're leveraging, which is called a keyless DFC, distributed fragments cryptography, um, and which is an innovative KMS as is. And fine, at least, you know, the TCO is much, much, much better in terms of, you know, much more appealing, right? Mm. Uh, the TCO for all of that, you can save your engineering Total lines. cost of ownership, uh, you Yeah, see? sorry yes. for the ones. Yeah, uh, total yeah. cost of ownership. So less of engineering, significantly change, uh, less of uh, uh, resource, uh, compute resources, right? And that's it. You can just drive on. And the, the onboarding is easy. There's automatic migration. That's a major significant uh, differentiator between us and the competition. Is this a cybersecurity disinformation campaign? All right, we have our next guest on stage. Uh, it is Dr. Zero Trust himself, Dr. Chase Cunningham. Please welcome Dr. Chase Cunningham. All right. I have a question about zero trust for you, Chase. All right. Are we taking zero trust too far? Over on the government technology blog, Dan Lorman, who's the field CISO at Presidio, said that over time, our perception of zero trust has expanded beyond what was in originally intended. It's evolved into the throwing away of the foundation of business, which is trusted human relationships. But that's not the purpose of zero trust methodology. Lorman quoted John Kindervag, who is credited with driving the zero trust trend more than a decade ago. Online trust is the vulnerability, said Kindervag. Quote, people aren't the issue. Packets are the issue. By way of context, Win Schwartow of SAC Lab said, quote, trust is a dynamic, not a static criteria. So Chase, I know you've been following this for a while. In the past decade, how has the zero trust concept evolved for the better? and for the worst. So originally the idea for Zero Trust was called deprimerization, right, which was actually um, much, uh, well, it's kind of gobbledygook to say, and it, but the concept was there of we, we will eventually live beyond the bounds of the perimeter, we gotta do something that recognizes that. And then it started to John's point, because he was visionary with this, of the network is the thing, because at that time the network was where the power lie. <laughs> so you fault solve that problem. We've evolved since that. Now the users are the ones, the admins, the accesses. If you look at where the bad guys go, which is where I always look, they don't, they don't hack firewalls necessarily. They don't care about packet manipulation. They go social engineering, go after humans, get access creds, and then wreck shop. So yes, it's evolved, and yes, it's evolved correctly, which I think now we see it, it ro rotating and revolving around identity, and those other things are part of ZT. But if you solve this problem first, you solve a very key and core problem, which is where the adversary goes after you. You know, this is, I, I have to kind of remind people that in, in the evolution, we're not in a just straight up defensive posture anymore. I wanna take the fight to the enemy. I'm gonna meet you at the door. I'm not waiting for you to come in the door and come into my home. That's a good point. All right. I'm assuming, JJ, that when you first heard the term zero trust and today, that understanding, that evolution of what that term meant, or it has changed over time, and maybe you've heard a lot of definitions of which some you agree with and some you don't. Yay, nay? I think you know, Chase hit it uh, spot on, so you know, his name, uh, Dr. Zero Trust, really <laughs> does uh, live. Uh, but you know, I think when I first started and, and learned about zero trust, it was with Beyond Corp, right? It was the Google, it was the Aurora hacks, and you know, very similar. They went to the network layer, right? Then they started looking at the devices, started talking about TPMs, and and looked at it with a you know cryptography to solve some of this, and had a policy engine and whatnot. But they started overlaying concepts, and I think one thing to not you know uh, jump the shark here is we need to do the basics right and then converge and, and compile all the other concepts right so IM do we have appropriate asset management do we have appropriate IM do we have 
uh, are we following least privilege and need to know? If we can't solve for any of those, then the, the journey down zero trust is going to be a, a very tough and, and uphill battle to solve for because you don't know what permissions to grant, what user, what asset to what data store. You're just kind of chasing your tail saying, hey, we're doing zero trust. You know, at the best, you're doing what the vendor tells you is zero trust. And so to go back to the you know, original question of are we over you know, um, prescribing zero trust. I think as an organizations, you know, and, and private sector, public sector, no. As vendors, I think it's, a, it's you know, coming from the, um, the executive order, it's a new ambulance to chase a bit, but it, the concept is dynamic. It's gonna be ever changing, and I, I, we really do need to kind of uh, evolve, right? I, 10 years ago, IoT and, and this large, um, you know, microcomputing at the edge didn't exist, right? Uh, really is now becoming uh, you know, day to day where you pull out your phone, you have 10 different devices. How are you managing 10 different identities for one different user, one, you know, multiple assets? You know, what asset should have access to what data store? So uh, I think you know, to follow up to, to Chase's comments, it, it is going to change and it has to be dynamic. So explain, you did a presentation about this earlier today, Chase. Walk our listening audience through the, the sort of the three just stages of zero trust. So in the identity space, really, I, I talk about kind of the three J's, right? Justify, just in time, and just once. If I can do those things, and honestly, like we've talked about, justify is probably the most difficult thing to get right in a policy engine. Um, but if you do those things, you're taking the power back from the adversary, and, that, and that's it. Let, let's focus on justify. Justify is, why is this person connecting to this database, this app, at this time, you know, this person's identity, is this, quote, justified? It's the should, not the, the could. Should, the should. So how do we develop that, I guess, understanding of the should? So the policy engines here have to be really powerful. They have to be able to take in lots of information. They have to be able to do the telemetry sort of coordination and then enable a decision to happen, which is the justification. You have a lot of these things. You have ticketing systems. You have contract management. You have all these other pieces, and everything out there nowadays has got an API pulling that information in, using it to fill that sort of process engine and actually make a decision that this needs to happen, that's key and core to this. And the funny thing is, the more you do this, the better you get at it. Everybody in the space talks about AI and ML. I'm a math guy. ML gets better with more. Well, I'm going to throw a little wrench into it. It does get better with more. With good more. With right. good more, right. If that's a but thing. But there is, there is a point where, you know, like, like anything, there is no kind of... There's always return. risk, right? And I mean, there's right. all, you're never going to be a billion percent. And the, right, other, right. the other thing that actually the guy that wrote this thing also said that there is no zero trust. I would agree with you. Just like a bodybuilder that has zero body fat will die. So <laughs> you have to have some. There's always going to be right, some. We live with some But risk. it's really not a good way to get people wrapped around the concept to go, let's have some trust. All right. Right. The other two, uh, just, just quickly cover yeah. those two as well. Just in time, you get it now, you do something, and then that's it. It's usually going to be session-based, and then just once. And it, you, you do it again. If you need it again, I do it again. And you can do this, and it doesn't interrupt the user's life cycle. You just make it fast. It seems that most programs out there, and that there are solutions for those last two, and like you said, and I'll throw this to you, uh, JJ, is how difficult is it to create policies to create a justify engine? I mean, it, it's, to Chase's point, it's a math problem. So you're looking at kind of data models, figuring out what are the patterns, and that solves for your repeatable patterns, the 80, the 90. And then you have to think about the break glass scenarios, right? And really think about as a business, what are the different risks and what are the different ways to get in if, if something does occur? Uh, and then it's just like programming and, and allow list on any firewall, right? You know this this server needs to talk to this server, so I'm going to create the ACLs. It's the same conversations, whether it's a human to a data store, a human to an application, application to a, to a server. What services should they talk to and then prevent the, the could they talk to conversation? You do that. It's just a simple conversation of policy. It, there's just a lot of legwork, and you have to kind of, you know, going back to, to Mike's conversation, 
have the appropriate conversation and communication to the to the right business partners and speak their language. I can't go to my CFO and say, "Well, you can't connect to SAP, and I'm going to start blocking port, you know, four four three. They're going to their eyes are going to roll, and they're going to be like, "What are you talking about?" Right? We need to speak the language as practitioners, whether you're an engineer or an analyst. I think that's the the, the biggest um, hurdle, right? For number one, is is not about the um, the the systems, it's, it's really just about us as practitioners of, of selling why zero trust is important. It's time for the audience question speed round. All right, I have here in my hand a handful of questions. I thought I had more. Hold on. I had a few more than this. Yes, I do. Um, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. I got plenty. Of, ah. I like long walks on the beach. <laughs> Those are not the questions the audience has for you, Chase. All right. Oh, it was worth All a right. shot. It was worth a shot. I got, a, I got six questions, I think. Let's try to see if we can hit all six. So I'm not looking for long answers. Some quick answers on this, and uh, give me what you got here. All right. Feel free, either one of you, to jump in with your first answer to this. Do you feel safer with your data all in one place or distributed? And this is from David Berger of SDG Corp. Distributed if done correctly. Is this, okay. What does if done correctly mean? There are ways to do distributed ledger stuff the right way and without the shenanigans of blockchain and actually have it be correct. All right. I like that answer. JJ? I think uh, I'll pick distributed as well, but again, done the right way, right? You need to have the right IM, ACL strategy to solve for distributed. Um, you then have a whole other conversation around data lakes and data warehouses that we could tackle you know, some other time. All right. What, and have you traditionally been distributed? Yeah, I mean, everyone, every application owner wants to manage their own data store, right? So yeah. you're going to have Unless to... Unless you're building it yourself. Right. All right, second question. This from, comes from Guy Martins of Object Sharp. Um, this is going to go to you first, because he's, he's oh. teasing your justify just in time and just once. Uh -oh. right. So how do you reduce friction with the whole business, that is, where security is trying to implement justify just in time and just once? I tell them that like anything else in life, change sucks and it's going to hurt, but we will get better over time and the policy engine and everything else will catch up to the pain we feel now. I would rather suffer for 30 minutes than die because I didn't do something. So my honest answer to them and not, not technology speak is change sucks, buckle up, let's get through this. So to some level I agree with you, but to some level people are like... I don't know. I don't like. I have, that means I have to trust what you're saying. Then you will fail. That's what fail? I would tell them. Your what choices you? do this, or you will fail. And if you think you're better than all these other companies that have failed at it, then show me how you do it differently. All right. I'm going to jump uh, jump to the next question. This comes from Daniel Fabo of Simpress, and I'll start with you, JJ. What is your biggest headache with regard to identity access management? Too many vendors. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, when you think about, you know, all these applications and y the, the biggest headache is that security wants a single IAM strategy and now I have 100 different SaaS applications that one of them, 10 of them could support Skim, 10 of them could support SSO, uh, two of them are standalone, three of them have no MFA support. That's my biggest pain is, is kind of the IAM sprawl. Um, Secrets Manager is here to help you, but it's, you know, I think that's the... Um, challenge that we're going to have to solve as a as an industry. There's OIDC, there's WebAuthn, there's protocols out there that are hopefully as as you know we go to HTTP three, Web three point it, it really starts becoming a, a repeatable pattern. But that's my my biggest pain point is is very similar to data sprawl is is um, identity sprawl. All right, I'm going to throw this one to you, Chase. This comes from Rolando Galan of Gobi IT. He asks. What would it take for us to live in a world with identity but no passwords? Uh, we need self-sovereign identity, we need biometrics, and we need the rapid adoption of those technologies for as much as possible, as fast as possible. Those techs have been around, especially biometrics, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. It's not happening fast now. Why? It's not happening fast now because there's still this reliance on the old paradigm. And like we said earlier, people are resistant to change. Even though you can say, like, look, this change is better, people look at it and go, but change sucks. So I'm going to do what I'm doing. Thanks. And you stay where you are. All right. I'm throwing this one to you, JJ. This comes from Carla Mencia Foley. And uh, she, she's from, with Caption Call. And she asks, what ways are you engaging with vendors today 
Remember, this is the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Fighting Podcast. Fighting the parking lot. <laughs> Finding the parking lot. What ways are you engaging with vendors today that you didn't do before? Are, are you in, first of all, are you engaging with vendors? Yes. Yes. So, okay, so what ways are you engaging with them today that you didn't do before? I mean, everything's virtual, but I, I think I typically I get phone calls and I just tell everyone, I will reach out to you when I know I want to solve this problem. I, I don't need a vendor to pitch that, hey, this is a challenge that you don't know about, you need to solve for it. You know, from an external face, I just think it comes off arrogant to say, hey, I know your problems, I know your challenges better, better than you do because I, you know, I do bug bounties. Like, ah, I wish you but did. But has, has any vendor really done true, and not a lot do this, but do true due diligence to try to learn about your environment? Yes, and so the vendors that, and I, I, I'm probably bad, I've been on parental leave, so you know, I take this with a grain of salt, but the vendors that actually, they'll, they'll say, hey, I listened to you on the CISO podcast, or I listened to you on another podcast, and kind of take a line or, or just do that digging. Sorry, and say, you're yeah. appearing on other podcasts besides mine. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, Go on. <laughs> but uh, I think that's where it goes a long way, right? Just make a human connection, and then, then we could have a, a, a conversation about and, and beyond just the company to company. I think when you, we have a human connection, especially nowadays, it goes you know, far and, and a lot further. All right, last question I want both of you to answer, and it's your time to trash a category here. From Suki Sui from Cerner, she asks, what's the most overrated tech category now? Most overrated tech category? Like, it, as far as yeah. just in this space in particular? Because yeah, yeah. there's it's, a lot of tech In cyber, we're going to uh, say in cyber in general. Artificial intelligence, period, point blank, in a story. Yeah? JJ? Um, that's 1A. I will pick two, uh, 1B, and I'll probably pick XDR. And why do you believe these both overrated? For XDR, it's just the same patterns, right? You, why do you need to throw an X? It's still an endpoint, still an asset. Because it's sexy, and X is <laughs> cool. You know, my, uh, my other co-host, Mike Johnson, said the same thing. It's the same darn product here. We're just creating a new category. Which but it has an X in it. It does have an X in it. Maybe that does, we'll help. That does right make after. it se sexy. <laughs> and, I, and I should also mention... And I've talked about this before. Why the heck is Gartner keeping m building more categories? Enough. Just stop. Have you, have you seen the threat cube? <laughs> what? How many categories in that? Go look at the... Th well, I mean, he's on a cube, right? Yeah, go look at the threat cube from Gartner. <laughs> It'll give you a headache. Yeah. Oh, geez. We don't need more categories. That brings us to the end of the show. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of my guests. Mike Rogers, Oded Haravan, and Chase Cunningham. By the way, Chase, I'm going to let you have the last word here. And I also have to thank our sponsor and the people who put on this phenomenal event in New York City, A Keyless. Thank you very much for A Keyless. Let's hear it for them. Go check them out for all your secrets management needs. Their web address is A and then Keyless, K E Y L E S S dot I O. Check them out. Um, uh, I always ask my guests, um, and uh, JJ, you're here. Are you hiring, by the way? Uh, I am. I, uh, I don't know how much headcount I have for 2022 because I've been slacking on uh, parental leave, so thank you, Compass, for, for allowing me to be here. But um, we are hiring in multiple positions for product, infrastructure security, enterprise security. Um, and so, yeah, definitely come on down, ping me on LinkedIn, or, or reach out to our uh, careers page. All right, JJ, any last thoughts on the topic in our discussion today? No, I mean, I think zero trust and, you know, secrets management, it, you, it's a needed part of any security program, right? Getting the right vendor, getting the right partner, and getting your organization to believe in it is going to be the biggest thing, right? Very similar to Chase. It's, he could tell everyone, but if they don't believe in it, you're not going to solve anything. And so I think it's you know, leverage and lean into the ROI, right, that it's going to constantly, it, it will provide you uh, better operational, uh, will provide you exactly what you want at the end of the tunnel, but it's just going to take some work. And just like everything worthwhile, uh, change is going to be good. Just just suck it up and go through it. <laughs> suck it up. Will that be the, th I think maybe that'll be the title of our episode. Suck it up, losers. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't mean that to. All right. Uh, Chase, any final thoughts on today's topic? I mean, I think the most important thing really is think about it from the perspective of the adversary, right? What are they going to use to cause problems? And then also look at the cyber Serengeti and figure out how not to be the slow gazelle. If you don't want to be them, do something different and you will not be them, which is a win. 
Excellent point. Again, I want to thank our audience here at KeyConf and all the phenomenal people at AKE. Listen, by the way, this production crew has been completely aces here. Kudos to the production crew. Come on. They have done an awesome job. These guys know how to produce an amazing show. So thank you very, very much. Uh, stick around. I believe we're having drinks next. Uh, thank you, as always, to our audience for your contributions and for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.